Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Allison Johnson, Manager of Communications at Windsor Regional Hospital with a special Cancer Centre Live webcast for you tonight. Um, throughout this conversation, Cancer Centre Live is an interactive live conversation and we want you all to participate. We're going to be talking for the next little while about breast reconstruction. So what are your options? Maybe you've been diagnosed uh, with cancer recently. Maybe you've had a lumpectomy or a mastectomy in the past and you want to consider your options. We're going to talk about those options tonight. And again, it's a live conversation. So please, if at any point in this conversation you want to add to this discussion, please do. We've got a live audience here with us for Breast Reconstruction Awareness, or Bra Day, at Windsor Regional Hospital. So everybody out there, if you can just, uh, we also have our friends on social media here. So maybe you guys can give us a thumbs up and let us know that you're out there. And all of you can give a big welcome to our friends on social media. So it's really too bad that you can't see each other, but now that we're all friends here, I do want to introduce you to two of our very special guests that we have with us tonight. Dr. Hanna Farhang. Dr. Farhang is a plastic surgeon at Windsor Regional Hospital, and she's going to talk to us tonight about what options are available for women in Windsor and talk us through what that procedure is like. And I also want to welcome Lee Monahan. Lee is a patient of Dr. Farhang and has very generously agreed to be with us tonight and share her experience and also answer any of your questions so that you know what this uh, procedure is like from a patient perspective. So thank you both of us for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for having, having us. Yeah. And again, any questions, please ask. You post on social media. Make sure, though, that your settings are public. Otherwise, we won't be able to see your questions there. And again, in the audience, if you have any questions, please fill out some of these pink cards and hand them to our volunteers. If our volunteers just want to wave your hands, they'll make sure that we get your questions. So, Hannah, let's start with you, Dr. Farhang. Um, what are we talking about tonight? When we talk about breast reconstruction, what does that mean? Uh, so today uh, is Bra Day. It's the first Bra Day event in Windsor, Ontario. And um, this is actually an international event. Uh, and uh, it's to raise awareness for breast reconstruction. So when women have uh, been diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, they may go undergo a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. And breast reconstruction is essentially a way to recreate the breast shape um, so that's one of the one of the things that we do. And I want to mention, she said this is the first bra day that we've had in Windsor. We didn't actually have a breast reconstruction program until Correct. very recently in Windsor. So Dr. Dr. Hannah Farhang and her partner Dr. Christina Lutz came and started this program. Before that, we didn't have this official program. Many, many women had to leave town to get breast reconstruction after a mastectomy, had to travel to London, or had to travel to Toronto for this procedure. So we're really fortunate now to be able to offer this to women in our community. And I just wanted to ask you, what does that mean, um, to be able to offer that to women in our community? Well, I think when I first started practice, I was in Toronto, uh, and I was, we were getting referrals from Windsor. Uh, and to me, it was very odd that women had to travel for four hours back and forth, more than four hours back and forth. So, um, and that was part of the reason why I wanted to come to Windsor is help develop this program. Uh, so for me, it means like being able to really give back to the community to have this program, I think uh, allows women, it gives them more control over their health um, and really gives them a sense of, um, a uh, sense of control back from having been diagnosed with breast cancer. Okay, and I want to bring Lee into the conversation now. How did you make that decision to have breast reconstruction done? Well, it was five years ago this month that I was diagnosed with cancer, and at the time, um, it was clear to me that if I wanted to have surgery immediately, that it would could be done here, but to have any kind of reconstruction would take um, at least a six-month wait and then have to book it in Toronto or London. And so at the time, there were a lot of considerations. Um, finances were part of it, not for the actual reconstruction, but for taking time off work and if there were any support, you know, family members coming to support me. Sure, that would be expensive. It would be very expensive for the hotel and the, and the food, et cetera, and the traveling. 
And so at the time I thought, this isn't an option for me. Um, so about a year ago, I decided that now's the time. I, I want to uh, take back my body. And so when I started to inquire, first I, asked, I called the plastic surgeon here in Windsor, not a candidate for it because I've had radiation and I should have known better. And um, I called London and London said they, they got me an appointment. But in the meantime, my family doctor, Dr. Pat Smith, recommended Dr. Farhang and I managed to get in, have a consultation, have my surgery before I could even have an appointment in London. So the, the timeliness was amazing and then of course having my family support here right in the city of Windsor was greatly appreciated. Absolutely. So let's talk about the surgery itself. Um, what is involved in the surgery that we're talking about? So um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, what options do women so, have when they come see you? So there you? are different options. In general, um, what we do, uh, we can reconstruct a breast either by using implants or by using your own tissue. Um, when we use uh, the implants, um, typically we can't put the implant in right away. We generally have to put a balloon, which is called a tissue expander, and that's placed underneath the chest wall muscle. So, um, when, so when we use the implant reconstruction, it's a, it's a process. So you actually have two surgeries. The first surgery is where we insert the balloon. Um, there's a time where is that you, what that is there? yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's why we have them. So this is uh, these are examples of the tissue expanders or the balloons. So you can see that the um, tissue expander has a port, um, and it's it's like empty right now. So we insert it empty, just like this, uh, underneath the chest wall muscle. So then we wait for a couple weeks so that the skin and everything heals, and then we slowly inflate this balloon uh, in our clinics. So the patients would come to our clinics um, every couple weeks, two to three weeks, and these balloons get expanded. Uh, once the expansion process is done, we uh, make the patients wait for about three to six months. The reason is that um, we need the skin to settle uh, down uh, before we go on to put in the implant. Um, so the, this is an example of some of the implants that we have. So these are just some examples of the implants. Um, and so we would exchange the actual tissue expander for an implant. So um, that is kind of a overall about uh, uh, how we use the implant reconstructions. Um, the second option is that we can use your own body tissue. Um, when we use your own body tissue, sometimes that tissue is actually kind of rotated into position. So we can take your, your belly tissue or we can take your back tissue. Um, when we do that, um, that is, uh, it's also, obviously it's a surgery, but uh, it's not as um, uh, big, it's not as a big surgery as we uh, have to do if you disconnect that blood supply. So um, the two first options we offer here in Windsor, that third option, if you have to disconnect the blood supply, like if, the, if you disconnect the blood supply, you have to find another source, which is typically the vessels underneath your chest wall. Um, that's called microsurgery, uh, and we're currently not doing that right now in uh, Windsor, um, but we have connections with London, so we are referral basis to London for the microsurgery. So that's kind of a summary. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes this will take more than one surgery you mentioned. The implants, yes, yeah. And Lee, you've had two? You've had a I've had two. I did not have this expander. And in fact, these breast implants look different than the one that I have. Um, Dr. Farhang suggested that I had another one that was shaped a little bit differently. And we did have some fat grafting. The first time, I think because of the scar tissue, the, the implant was not the correct size. It seemed to recess back into my chest cavity. I won't yeah. be using any technical terms. It was going backwards. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so the second time when I um, received a larger implant, I could not have uh, the fat grafting at the time. So 
my next procedure will yeah. be to have the fat grafting. Yeah. So with Lee's example is a little bit different um, because she had a lumpectomy and a radiation. So um, what I had talked to you about before was patients that have mastectomies, so the in entire breast removed. Uh, but if you have a lumpectomy and radiation, the reconstruction becomes a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the reason is, is that the radiation causes a lot of scarring to the chest wall. And so um, prior to us um, proceeding, or one of the things we had was called fat grafting. So um, what we do is actually take fat from the stomach or the belly. We just take it out as we do with like a liposuction, but it's a small volume liposuction. Uh, and then we inject it into the chest wall. So we release all of the scar and inject it into the chest wall. So, um, yes, you have a question? <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. yeah. So that's one of the procedures that Lee had. Um, but because Lee s had breast tissue already, she had a, she had a bit of a, a deep, like when you have a lumpectomy and radiation, you kind of get a bit of a, uh, if you imagine, you're just kind of taking a bite out of a, like a, uh, an apple. Just imagine it like that. You take a bite out of an apple, so it kind of stays contracted down like that. It's scarred down. So we release the scar and put some fat in that area. Um, the other thing we did was also put a, an implant. Um, and uh, the reason why is also because of the radiation. The ra radiation really contracts down the breast, but we were trying to make it bigger to be more symmetrical to the other side. Yeah. And to extend the metaphor, if you take a bite of a little apple, it's really a big bite. <laughs> yeah. So even though it was a lumpectomy, for me it was a considerable amount of my breast. Yeah. So what does the surgery feel like? Um, and what does it feel like after to have the implant in? It, it feels, um, you were talking about the uh, capsulization. So it does feel that there's some restriction around it. Um, it does feel natural, but I do find that um, currently where my original incision was from the operation, I can still see that. There's, it's almost like a folding. Um, and so I think the fat grafting is going to make it full, like you were mentioning. Um, my, I did have an implant in my other breast in, for symmetry, and that one feels very natural, and um, I'm pleased with it. So I was going to ask about that. You go through, you have the surgery done, and your breast looks great because Dr. Farhang's great. Yes, yes. What about the other breast that still has three decades of gravity on it? And yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of things that we can do to the other breast. Um, for example, what Lee had was a breast augmentation onto the other breast that was not affected. Uh, and we do that to achieve symmetry. So that's one of the things that we can do. Um, it is uh, covered under our current OHIP insurance, so there's no fee for the patient for that type of surgery. For both breasts? For both covered. breasts, yeah. This is all covered. Yeah, this is, yeah. And, and I wanted to mention, and that was part of my lack of knowledge. So I didn't ask that question. I made an assumption. That ask, you would have to pay? Right. Ask questions because I waited five years for something that I didn't need to I thought it was part of my part of my struggle was I thought that it was vain um, I, I thought maybe it was something that I shouldn't be doing because had it cost money that was money that I was taking from my daughters and so I wanted to make sure that my daughters made it through university they both did I'm a very proud mama I'm a grandma um, my baby's nine months old my grandbaby's nine months old. I keep calling her my baby. And watching tonight. Yes, and she's watching tonight. Hi, Kennedy. Hi, Kylie. And, um, but I thought it was something that was selfish. And I've really changed. I've really changed um, because I do want to be a role model to my daughters. And it isn't selfish taking care of yourself. Uh, it isn't cosmetic. It's so much more than that. It's, it's my self-esteem. It's, it's taking back what I felt that I lost. And you talk about earlier um, on the screen, it talked about so many things about um, the loss, the loss that you have. And it really, I didn't, I wasn't that flustered when I lost my hair, but I was really, I was really saddened when I lost part of my breasts. And so for many years, I put that on the back burner. But I didn't ask the question, is the other breast covered? And I knew that, you mentioned the three decades of gravity. Um, 
I'm almost 54, 54 next month. And so the, the left breast was not as perky as the right breast. And so I wanted to have that augmentation. And, and now I realize that this, that's my right. I, I earned it. It's not selfish. And ask the questions and find your peace of mind. Very good advice. And I wanted to ask you, because we talk about this um, as maybe cosmetic surgery, but is it more, um, is it about the physical healing more or about the emotional healing more? For me, it's certainly about the emotional healing. The physical healing, I, I like to think I'm a tough <laughs> cookie. Um, I have a pretty high threshold of pain. I don't do well with drugs. <laughs> it, I, um, I'm a lightweight when it comes to drugs but I think I have a high threshold for pain. But emotionally, I denied a lot. I was in denial about how much uh, sadness that I had. And I, and I always compared it to other people. I always thought, well, yes, this isn't wonderful, but it's not as bad as that. And that's not a bad way to look at things, but at the same time, I don't think it honored my loss. And so emotionally, I probably should have been more honest with myself and my family and my friends about the sadness that I was experiencing. And thank you for talking about that today because I think that that's really important and that's really what Cancer Center Live is about. You said ask questions and sharing different experiences. So thanks for being here and I want to um, draw on what you were saying about asking questions because we have a lot of questions here from our guests both in the audience tonight and on Facebook. I'm going to start with this one from Janet Williams who's joining us from Facebook. Thanks for joining us Janice. She wants to know are the tissue expansions painful? So um, <laughs> I, I hear a couple of people laughing. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> are they painful? So. Is, does, I have your question here. Yep. Let me just, I'm just going to read it yep. so that people at home can yep. hear. Does the pressure of the expander lessen as I have my injections? Okay. So um, this, when you come into our clinic, so we do it as an outpatient clinic. So you're coming to us, you're awake for the procedure. Um, in general, uh, you do feel a pressure at the time of us putting in the fluid. It's about 50 cc's, so it's not a lot of fluid, but still uh, people do like describe discomfort at the time that they have the, f the, the tissue expander expanded. Um, it generally goes away within a few days. Um, I have had some patients that have called back uh, and have said, you know, this is very, very painful for me, so I would just manage their pain um, with pain medication. Um, the other thing is sometimes uh, that can contribute to it is that you may get muscle spasms because it's underneath the actual chest wall muscle. So you can get muscle spasms. Um, and also if you have some anxiety around it, all of that contributes to the tightening of the muscle tissue. So I think a combination of um, you know, controlling uh, anxiety medications, muscle relaxants, and pain medication. If you're, you know, if it's really bothering you, uh, then I've, I've talked to patients about that. But in general, people come in, uh, we do the tissue expansion. They go, they're uncomfortable for a couple of days, but they go home. And they don't, they may take some pain medication at the time that they have their expansion, but it's, it should get better. Yeah, it should get better. I have a question about the implants. Yeah. How long do they last? So um, if you talk to the company, uh, you know, they, the, the FDA Health Canada says that these aren't lifetime devices. Um, so they're, you know, and uh, as someone else described them, they're kind of like, you know, you may, they're not like uh, tires per se, but someone described them like that today. Um, but you, they don't necessarily need to be replaced unless you have a problem with them, okay? So some of those problems, sometimes these implants break, right? So you may need the implant replaced because the breakage has caused some 
distortion of your breast. Um, sometimes people get a thick capsule around the implant. Um, you get a capsule anytime you put in a breast implant. Some women have really thin capsules. Some women have very, very painful capsules. Um, and these capsules can distort the shape of your breast or uh, cause a lot of pain. If that's the case, then we would go in, you know, possibly replace the implant, take the entire capsule off, and have to redo the surgery. So um, to answer your questions, they're not meant to be lifetime devices, but we don't go looking to replace them all the time, like, mm -hmm. unless there's a problem with them. Yeah. And what does it feel like? Do you feel like you have an implant in, or does it feel like it's part of you? It definitely feels like it's part of me. Um, it doesn't move. I did bring my bra, my compression bra. You're supposed to wear it for about six weeks, is that correct? After your breast surgery. My daughter's just going to grab it. And um, it holds them in place. And that way, and you're not supposed to do anything strenuous, which is not, that wasn't a real difficult for, thing for me. Um, she said, don't go running, not a problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this is what the bra looks like. And uh, actually, I got it from the Delicate Touch. And uh, so it's an excellent bra, and it's, uh, it, and that, but now it really feels na very natural to me. Pretty. Yeah, other way around. Yeah. So the reason why, why we recommend these, these bras is because they do up in the front, and they have these little sides here. So they're, they're, they come on and off pretty easy. So kind of reminds me of a, yeah. a breastfeeding bra <laughs> without, like, the flap. But, uh, <laughs> but it did hold me in place, um, everything in place, and then now... Um, I've, nothing moves. It's exactly the way it should feel. And before we get to a few more questions, I will mention, because Lee just did, um, that the Delicate Touch did help us do some decorating today. The Delicate Touch out on Dougal Avenue, if you haven't checked them out. We've got a sample of their work here, but apparently they've got 5,000 more where those came from, and they specialize in bra fittings and um, especially helping women after reconstructive surgery. So if you're interested in any of these, go check them out. May, may I add something to that, Allison? Absolutely. I was very confused about sizing. So when I wanted to know what size I wanted to be, kind of asked around. It's such an awkward, it's, it's an awkward question. <laughs> well, you get question. to pick, right? Yeah. yeah. Naturally, and you so don't get to choose. That's, that's correct. And so I wanted to be natural. And um, so I asked someone who I thought, OK, I wonder what size she is. But everybody's different. And I didn't really know that until I went to the Delicate Touch, because when I got sized, it was it the size that I thought that I was? And so that's a really curious thing, too. Um, getting a professional to, to size you is a really important <laughs> thing. Don't go out and invest in a bunch of brand new bras and to find out that it's really not your sizing at all. How do you talk to somebody about choosing the right size of an implant? Yeah, so we, I mean, t uh, from a surgical perspective, we have some limitations. Uh, based on uh, how big the chest width is. Uh, so we do some measurements in our office and, and see how big their actual chest width is this way. Um, and then we um, kind of gauge as to what size they do want. Um, I, t I do a couple of things in my office. I usually um, ask them to kind of either check, like cup their breasts to see what size they are, we, I have all of these implants in my office, so we kind of decide based on that as well. So what size would this be this right here? This is a 500cc, so yeah. So 500cc means two cups. So two cups. Yeah. So B? Yeah, I think no. that's more of a, f a C. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it just depends, right? Um, uh, and it's, it's hard to, like this whole BC, it's very, it's very <laughs> difficult because as you know, um, it's, you go from one store to the other uh, and it's a different size. But it's, this is probably like a, like a full, like a C, a full B. Yeah. Okay. Which is interesting because I had a 250 cc's. So half that. Half of that. So, but who knows? <laughs> But that was on your other side, correct? Right. Yeah. Right. So, right. so if you already have your exactly. So if you already have breast tissue, breast tissue yeah. and you want to increase that size, the actual like if you look at all comers of breast augmentation, people that don't have cancer, 
uh, but are having breast augmentation, the average implant size is about 350, 300. People don't, it's not typical to put in a 800 cc implants. It's not usual. Okay. We, yeah. Yep. So that we don't sense. typically do that. <laughs> but, <laughs> so a question. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why she only needed 250. You look CCS. great. Yes. <laughs> a question now needed. from the audience: um, At what age would you advise not to get rebuilt, at, or any age? Well, I, I mean, I. One of my points, um, you guys missed our discussion earlier, but one of the points is that it's a personal decision. So um, we don't discriminate against age. Um, it's just that if you, you know, for example, let's say you're. 75 and you want to have breast reconstruction you know if you have multiple medical problems you have you know diabetes heart disease you know stroke all these things going on it's probably not a good idea to undergo an elective surgery mm -hmm. right but you know if you're in good health um, and this is something that you've wanted we don't we don't I, I, Dr. Lutz and I do not discriminate against uh, age so a question from Rachel on Facebook. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. She wants to know, can an immediate reconstruction occur following a mastectomy during the same surgery? And if so, what is the criteria? Yes, that's an excellent question. And it, again, we talked about that a bit earlier today. So um, you can have breast reconstruction, uh, what we refer to as either immediate or delayed. So immediate means at the time that you're going to have uh, breast cancer surgery. It's generally with a mastectomy. Sometimes we do it with lumpectomies, but that's on a special occasion. Uh, but it's generally with a mastectomy. Um, so that's immediate. A delayed reconstruction happens um, after your cancer treatment is done. Uh, so that can be any time. It can be five years, 10 years, 20 years. So it doesn't matter when you have a delayed reconstruction. We typically will wait about a year after you've had radiation before, if you've had radiation, then we wait before we go on to do the reconstruction. The reason being is that uh, there's a lot of uh, damage that happens to your natural skin just from the radiation. So we'd like to wait around that 12 month mark to make sure that you've recovered pop properly. Um, so the second part of your question, you wanna know who's a candidate. Um, so, you know, it's a decision that's made between yourself, the, your breast surgeon, and the reconstructive surgeon. You know, the primary goal is for you to have cancer treatment. That's always the primary goal. Um, but to just give you a global statement, people that have early disease, generally, if you're, you know, have what's called DCIS or stage one, stage two, like we typically do those reconstructions. Um, but if you're a little bit more advanced, we know you're gonna have chemotherapy, radiation, like there's a lot going on. And so um, sometimes, we, you know, in most cases, we, we recommend that you wait. Um, but that's a decision you'd need to speak with your surgeon about, yeah. Does it affect the outcome, um, the final product, if you wait a certain period of time? Um, the the final of, look, the final um, reconstruction, is it? If you, like, do you mean if we do a delayed or immediate? Right. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, just hearing background. Um, so, yes and no. Um, I think that when we do it immediately, what happens is that you have the mastectomy, so we have that skin. Like when you have a mastectomy, they take the breast tissue, but they don't take all of the skin off. So, as a reconstructive, you know, aesthetic surgeon, we actually have skin available so that we can. Um, that helps us re reconstruct. So we have what's called the tissue envelope um, and also the breast footprint. So these are all things that we use to help us with our reconstruction. So in general, um, it does somewhat provide a better aesthetic look when we do it immediately. Um, but, um, you know, the delayed reconstruction, it, it all depends too, right? The type of reconstruction and when we're doing it, yeah. A question now from our audience. Um, if you use the muscle from the back, how does this impact your physical strength and mobility? And then part two, what holds the fat in place to keep it in shape? Okay, so, um, so for everyone that's listening on Facebook, uh, so sometimes what the question is alluding to is sometimes we use the muscle from the, the back 
we use the muscle and the skin from the back. So the muscle that we use is called the latissimus dorsi muscle. Uh, so it, um, you know, is a, it is one of the big muscles of the back. And so what we do with that is we actually take the entire muscle and, and it's a ta it's, it has skin and um, fat as well. And it gets rotated uh, from your back to your front to help with the reconstruction. Um, so in general, um, you know, you do have a little bit of weakness. Um, so in people that are very active, like, you know, rock climbers, um, you know, extreme sports, um, if you're doing a lot of like, you know, like if you're doing really advanced yoga or something like that, I would probably recommend that if that's very important for the patient, then probably is not the best idea. But for most people, you don't necessarily need that muscle. You know, you're not rock climbing every day, right? So <laughs> you don't need it. So in general, most, most of my patients do not complain of any weakness. Um, and uh, the second part of your question, so how does that fat survive? So it survives because the muscle provides it blood supply. So there's a blood supply that comes that supplies the muscle and it branches out, it goes through the fat and to the skin and keeps it alive. So that's how that keeps it alive. I think somebody in the audience. Somebody has, in the audience has a question? Yeah, that was my question. And, um, just one second, if you can just wait for the mic so our friends on Facebook can also hear you. Um, I don't think you answered the second part that yeah. are, you misunderstood. Oh, sorry. What I wanted to know was how does that, like if you take it from the fat tissue or the muscle, how do you get it to hold the natural shape of a breast? Do you use something uh, that keeps that shape or does it just... So that's the kind of the aesthetic portion of, of it. So we stitch, we do a lot of stitching to keep, um, so we stitch the muscle into place uh, and that gives it the shape. Um, but really like when we take it, we take it kind of in an ellipse fashion. So it. Bring, it brings it to the front, uh, and it actually hangs like normal tissue. So, um, I'm, I'm just not sure, like, are you talking about the fat grafting, or are you, you're yeah, talking? Both of them, like in, in both, like, so you explain sure that one, now about the fat, if you're using the fat. Are you, you're talking about the fat grafting? Yes. Okay, so yeah. those are two separate, completely separate things. So. Um, so the first question had to do with using your own tissue uh, and rotating a muscle into place. The second question she's referring to is called fat grafting. So we haven't talked about the fat grafting on Facebook, um, but sometimes what we do, and actually what Lee had was mm -hmm. fat grafting. So we take fat from another part of your body, so whether it's your thighs or your stomach, and we take it out um, like with, as we do with liposuction. We take the fat and we isolate the fat and then we inject it into an, another area. So that fat, so it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a balance. So you put the fat in, but in general, I tell my patients, you're probably going to lose about 30 to 40% of that fat because some of it doesn't survive. So it survives from the surrounding blood sub vessels and the nutrients that are around the, the tissue. But about 30 to 40% doesn't survive. So if you're a candidate to have fat grafting, I usually say you're probably gonna need a few different sessions. So uh, as you've had, have had, and we're planning on doing her, the second fat grafting session for her uh, in January, or no, December. She has soon. A, yeah, yeah, very soon. Um, one of the questions that I had for Dr. Farhang is, because when I lose weight, the first place I lose weight is in my chest. And so I said, you know, if I start to get back in shape and lose weight, will I lose weight there? And you said, absolutely, because it's fat. Yeah. But uh, you will lose it proportionately. Correct, yeah. You're not going to lose more on one side than the other. Correct. Um, and I, I lost my thought about the other thing, but I'm sure it'll come back. Oh, the fat grafting, yes. So I did have, I uh, opted from my legs. I told her that she, she was only going to take 100 cc's. I said, you can take more. Like, it's okay. <laughs> just knock yourself out because it might, you might, you know, it might dissolve. Just keep going at it. But <laughs> get so, a two for one here. Well, <laughs> if we don't do as we don't do it. It's not a cosmetic no. procedure. So we do take a little bit, uh, but it's not to the extent. It's not a... A sculpting procedure. No, of course not. Like 100 cc's <laughs> yeah. really is, is not one much. fifth of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So I have um, Jeanette here who's joining the conversation from Facebook. Thanks for joining us tonight. And she says, I've had full double mastectomies and both silicone 675 cc implants same day and then two days later reconstructive surgery with tattoo coloring in London. So thank you for sharing your experience and that brings up another point that we haven't talked about yet which is the tattooing. Um, so and that is for the nipple maybe I'll get you to talk a little bit about that. Sure so um, so the nipple reconstruction and um, we uh, it's usually kind of like the icing on the cake because I say it's the last thing that we actually do. Uh, the nipple reconstruction happens about three to four months after all of your reconstruction is done. There's a number of ways for us to do the nipple, re nipple reconstruction. Um, one way of doing it is that we use, we use the skin uh, that's existing on your chest and we create a small little flap to create the actual projection of the nipple. Um, and then, and then we, what we do is just kind of tattoo around the areola part. The second way of doing that uh, is doing uh, 3D tattooing, uh, which uh, gives you the illusion of having a nipple. So when you're looking at somebody face on, you actually can, it looks like a real nipple, but when you kind of look at from the side, they don't have that projection. So uh, some patients are candidates to have both. Some patients we recommend just having the, the tattooing because they don't have enough tissue for us to do the actual small little flap. Um, the other point about the nipple reconstruction here in Windsor is that the Cancer Foundation has uh, been donate has donated um, uh, has donated at Please least yeah the, them done. done here essentially. So I think we have maybe about fifty a year that they support us for. So the nipple reconstruction here we are, we are funding, which is great because it's, that's the only thing that's not covered by OHIP. <laughs> and I think that's really unique in this area, and I'm yes. glad that you brought that up. The uh, Cancer Center Foundation here in Windsor covers that, and also some of the equipment and supplies needed uh, for the reconstructive surgery yes, um, to be able to happen here absolutely, in Windsor. Absolutely, yeah. So the, the fat grafting equipment has been donated from the Cancer Foundation. There are pieces of uh, equipment that we use for very specific reconstructions that cost thousands of dollars uh, and they've been supporting us. So it's been really great to have their, their support for this. A question from Julie in the audience, um, and I'm not sure if you can answer this or maybe we can take it offline if not, but she wants to know, could I get transferred to a surgeon in Windsor for RX follow-ups instead of going to Toronto? To have the follow-ups here? Yes. We, in general, we typically, if you've had a surgeon do your reconstruction or if you have a surgeon do any surgery on you, we generally like you to follow up with that patient. I mean, even myself, if I have operated on somebody, I want to see that patient. So in general, we just typically like to have, um, if you've had your reconstruction somewhere else, we would you know, recommend that you see your surgeon. Okay. Another question, somebody wants to know how safe are the implants? I know that there yeah. was a concern um, a while back. We would hear that maybe they could make you sick. Yeah, so the, I mean, there, um, and I believe the early 90s, the, the implants were taken off the market because there was just a lot of scare about the complications from them. But the implants that we use now are safe. We talked, when you come to my office, we talk like, like any other surgery, we talk about all of the complications that can happen with breast reconstruction and the implants. I have a 20 page consent form that most of you will have to read and sign because I want you to know every problem that can happen when you have the reconstruction. And it's really my duty to tell you all of the things that can happen. Um, but from what we know now, um, these implants are safer, the FDA, the Canada Health, no one's there there has been no study to suggest that these implants are not safe so here's an interesting comment uh, from Facebook um, she writes I've got microchips ID in my implants just for safety if I go missing you can find me all new stuff out there with implants is that true do we I don't know <laughs> are they, is Allergan is Allergan a mentor here because I don't know the answer to that <laughs> not that I know but interesting idea yeah. Yeah. Oh, Anna, do you know? Not yet. Not yet. The rep is here. She says that's not possible, <laughs> at least not in Canada. So, 
Uh, a question from Cindy. Cindy, thanks for joining us. Do you do a skin flap reconstruction using your stomach? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, so we do use so the stomach tissue to reconstruct the breast. Um, sometimes we, when we use the lower stomach tissue, uh, we keep it attached to the blood, blood vessel and we can rotate that whole muscle into place. Sometimes we disconnect the blood vessel. So you actually, like if you imagine you have the fat, it's got a small little artery and a vein that's connected to it and we actually, you dissect that entire artery and vein um, and then you cut, you disconnect the blood supply then you reconnect that into the chest wall. So it's a big surgery. That is called microsurgery. Um, and unfortunately right now, we're not doing microsurgery in Windsor. Um, we have uh, connections with London right now. Uh, and you, you know, Dr. Delizer was here tonight talking about that. So we have a, a, a good connection with London to send, our uh, send those referrals there. But if you are having any uh, reconstruction with your stomach or your back that does not require disconnection of the blood supply, so you just rotate it into position, we still do that in Windsor. Yeah. A question now from Nancy. She wants to know how long after reconstruction can you get the 3D tattooing, specifically the flap surgery? So after the flap surgery, you can get nipple reconstruction at any time. Yeah. Actually, the flap surgeries, the... Um, uh, you know, when you have, when you're talking about flaps, you're actually taking tissue and putting it back into your chest. So you have your own tissue. So you can have a small little flap or you can have 3D tattooing. You have all the options. It's the patients that have sometimes the implants and have really, really thin skin on top that it makes us, we kind of just actually recommend them to have the, the nipple um, re uh, tattooing done. A question here from Andrea. Um, it says nipple sparring versus skin sparring yeah. in BRCA in gene BRCA patients. Yeah. Risk of cancer between the two options. Is that something that you can comment on? <laughs> no. So I those. So that's a very. So that's a, um, a, a discussion you would have with your general surgeon. Um, so she is. You're talking about a nipple sparing or skin sparing mastectomy. Uh, and I would defer, I don't see Dr. Gatvey here, but <laughs> I would defer the cancer, uh, you know, all of that cancer stuff, I defer to the general surgeons, yeah. Yeah. So with the different types of reconstruction, how do you screen for cancer in the future? Is that a, another surgeon question? No, I, I, can, I can answer that. So, um, I mean, we screen, so if you imagine, if you have a mastectomy, means that you've taken the entire breast tissue out. So you're left, you're theoretically, like not, not theoretically, you have removed the entire breast. So you should have no breast tissue. If you have a cancer recurrence, the most likely place it's gonna happen is on the skin somewhere. So those patients are typically followed with clinical examination. It's too difficult, you don't typically do a mammogram for those patients. It's, it's, there's nothing to mammogram. You obviously would mammogram the other breast um, just to see if there's been changes to the other breast. Uh, so that's with the mastectomy. With lumpectomies, I believe you would still, because you still have breast tissue, you would still have a mammogram. Yeah. This question is um, from Jackie Pizzuti from Wigs to Wellness. She had a, a vendor booth set out outside and she says, several of my clients have had mastectomies with no reconstruction. And I often see keloid scars. Is that, am I pronouncing it? Keloid scars, yeah, keloid scars, yeah. Okay, keloid scars and lack of self-esteem as a result. Um, can you surgically remove these scars? So first off, yeah. what are the scars and can they be fixed? Yeah, so keloid are, or hypertrophic scars is just an abnormal formation of a scar. So normally the scar ends up being a very thin line uh, but sometimes some people have thick scars uh, or raised scars, um, and the scars kind of grow outside of proportion. Uh, I don't know if you, you might have noticed it on people's earlobes, like big earlobes. Those are typical keloid scars. Um, we really don't know who develops them. Sometimes there's a genetic predisposition, but um, it really just depends on how you feel, unfortunately. Um, if you have a keloid scar, uh, it's 
difficult to surgically remove it because anytime you make another cut, you're going to have more keloid scars. Um, so sometimes we manage those with steroid injections. Uh, sometimes we do cut them out again, but we're very conservative when we cut them out. Um, and then we can put steroids in right away. Um, so conservative in meaning like we don't take the entire thing out. We actually just do an inside cut, like inside of the actual keloid and then make and close it. And then a few weeks later we may put steroids in there. Um, if you've had really, really bad keloids, uh, it's, there's other medical treatments for it. You know, radiation is one of them too, but um, uh, that's kind of, you know, I, that's out of my realm of practice. But. So we've got a few more questions here, but we are getting low. Um, and I just want to remind you, if you do have any questions, get them in. And also for Lee. Lee has gone through this um, <laughs> as a patient and has lots of uh, good um, words of advice for all of us. Um, the next question is an audience question, and uh, it is, if my ongoing hormonal medications are causing weight changes, how do I decide when to get reconstructive surgery done after a lumpectomy? And it says, like, balancing reduction. Yeah, so if you're, I mean, ideally, it's good to wait until your weight is stable six months to a year. Um, the reason being is that if you're losing or gaining or losing weight, uh, then it, it, it influences the, the cosmetic output, outcome, sorry. Um, and also if you have, you know, a high BMI, again, you're at increased risk of having complications. So to give you a safe uh, surgery uh, and, have good out and have a good outcome, we typically would like you to have, you know, a, a, a reasonable BMI um, and a stable weight for about six months to a year. Um, and this is kind of with any surgery. So even when we do a breast reduction, we know that if your BMI is like higher than 32, 33, you're just going to have more problems. We know that. So it's, it's just that it becomes, you know, you have wound healing problems. You may have an infection, like you have a fluid collection. It's, it just happens, unfortunately. So. Another audience question, somebody wants to know, how does pregnancy affect the abdomen with a free flap option? So, um, meaning that you've had the free flap and then you get pregnant? Is that the question? Is, the Is there somebody here who asked that yeah. question? So, oh, if you can just wait for the mic there. Yeah, the mic is coming to you. I'm sorry. Yes, if you've had the free flap and then there's a pregnancy. Yeah, so I guess um, it depends on the type of reconstruction that you've had. Um, if you have um, the microsurgery, so theoretically with that, with that microsurgery, you're kind of keeping the uh, integrity of the abdominal wall. So you just take, it's called a deep flap. So you're just taking the skin and the fat, and then you <coughs> dissect the artery and the vein out from the muscle. Um, and so with that type of reconstruction, we typically don't, I mean, there is a risk of you having a, an abdominal bulge, um, but it typically keeps the muscles in place. Uh, you can get pregnant, um, you know, you can, uh, you can get pregnant from any one of those, any type of, you know, after having either one of the surgeries, but it's just that your abdominal wall has had surgery and it, you know, you may be at an increased risk of having hernias. So, yeah. I want to bring Lee back into the conversation now and just generally, um, as we close the conversation down and wind down here, what advice do you have for people out there who are thinking about uh, their options right now, be it um, what type of surgery or even whether or not to go forward with the surgery? I think you, you need to, for me, what I needed to do was really consider, um, is it the right time? And is this something that I really want? And so I would just encourage people to honor themselves. Um, and for me, put myself first. You can't take care of others until you take care of yourself. And so I knew that it was really important for my mental health, for my self-esteem, that for me to feel whole, I wanted to take back what I felt that I lost. And so 
I'm, I'm glad that I followed up. I'm glad that uh, Dr. Farhang is here in Windsor. Um, it was a perk to find out that, that things were covered, um, but I would have proceeded anyhow. I think that it's, uh, it's not selfish at all. I think that to the self-love, you know, to, to honor myself, to honor my sadness um, and my loss, and to say, okay, it's time for me now. And so I would encourage people to, to think about it, to, to think about their options. It, um, it's different for everyone. I, I think all the changes will be different for everyone. And ask the questions. You know, I mentioned that earlier, just to ask the questions and then have an informed decision. Because I think a lot of the decisions that I made were out of ignorance. And so. Well, thank you very much for being with us here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Farhang, for, for sharing all of your uh, expertise there. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. And if you do have further questions, please post them online. We will continue to answer them as we can. And all of you at home, thank you so much for joining us. This was our first broad day at Windsor Regional Hospital. Yeah. I understand uh, that uh, we may have more in the future. I think that this was a really helpful event and a really good way to connect with people and answer questions, which yeah. was what it was all about. So thanks again yeah. very much. And cheers, everybody. Yeah. Have a good night. Nice. Good night, everyone.